we have now spoken about all seven sacraments. And yet there is more to be said about baptism in Christ, especially after what has been said about Christian matrimony. According to the Catechism, all Christians, in any state or walk of life, are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. For every one of us, the Catechism teaches that Christ is the center of all Christian life. The bond with Him takes precedence over all other bonds, familial or social. Consecrated or religious life, the life of monks and nuns and others in religious vows, is a way to live the baptismal life and the call to holiness in a deeper way, so as to signify and proclaim in the Church the glory of the world to come, as the Catechism says. These men and women religious, as we call them, profess the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. There are also many who live a dedicated Christian life by making private vows, or simply by living the evangelical counsels through a personal decision and commitment. You may wonder what the expression evangelical counsels means. Evangelical means related to the gospel, the evangelion, the good news of Christ. And a counsel is something that is advised and offered and recommended, but not required of everyone as a commandment. So poverty, chastity, and obedience are gospel ways of life, encouraged and advised to any who are able freely to accept them. The vows taken by some religious, such as Benedictine monks and nuns, are expressed differently. But in all forms of consecrated life, the evangelical counsels are central. Vowed religious life is called in Catholic tradition a state of perfection, because its goal is to follow Christ with an undivided heart. Is there a biblical basis for this vocation to follow Christ by a special form of dedication, one that is not required of everyone? Yes. Consider a well-known episode from St. Mark's Gospel. A rich young man came to Jesus, seeking the way of perfection in holiness. Our Savior called him to renounce all his goods for Jesus' sake, and to find true treasure in heaven by following the Lord Jesus. Notice that Jesus did not say this to everyone who followed him. This was a special vocation. That young man refused the Lord's call, but others accepted it. St. Peter himself tells Jesus, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? Jesus answered, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many that are first will be last and the last first. Jesus tells his apostles, Not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. Already in the apostolic church there were virgins and widows and penitents and celibates, like the apostles themselves, who had a special place in the life of the church and as witnesses to Christ's kingdom. About them, St. Paul says this, In view of the impending distress, it is well for a person to remain as he is. Those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the form of this world is passing away, so that he who marries his betrothed, 
does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do better. So wrote St. Paul to the Corinthians. Still today, the Lord calls some to follow him with an undivided heart by living the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. The vowed religious life is called in Catholic tradition a state of perfection. Now, many people are uneasy with this terminology since the word perfection sounds prideful and self-important in the mouths of men and women who are supposed to be practicing humility. However, this reaction is largely due to a misunderstanding of what perfection really means. The word perfect in this context, as in grammar, means simply complete, completely fulfilled. St. Thomas Aquinas puts it this way, Now the spiritual life consists principally in charity. For he that is without charity is spiritually nothing. Hence, St. Paul says, If I should have all prophecy, and should know all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith, so that I could move mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Therefore, he that is perfect in charity is said to be perfect in the spiritual life absolutely. Since the three evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience seem most definitely to prepare one for this detachment, they belong quite appropriately to the state of perfection. Not as if they were perfections themselves, but but that they are dispositions to perfection, which consists in being detached from care for the sake of God. Now, St. Thomas acknowledges that all of Christ's faithful are called to holiness, that is, to the perfection of charity. Certainly, monks and friars and nuns have no monopoly on charity or on faith or hope either. Still, Catholic teaching is that the religious life has a higher perfection, not as an end in itself, but as a means to the end, which is union with Christ. The Church at the Council of Trent, infallibly and for all time, defined that celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of God is of higher perfection than marriage as a means to the holiness that all Christians seek. Some are under the mistaken impression that the Second Vatican Council changed this doctrine, but that is not the case. The Council reaffirmed this teaching in its decrees on religious life and on the training of priests, and Pope St. John Paul II also reaffirmed it as recently as 1996, when he wrote that the consecrated life, which mirrors Christ's own way of life, has an objective superiority. The Catechism upholds the same teaching. Everything that the Church believed before the Second Vatican Council concerning religious life, she still believes and teaches. Nothing has changed on this matter. Some ask, is it necessary to speak of degrees of perfection in different vocations? Is it not more important how one lives one's own vocation rather than ranking it in relation to other vocations within the Church? Yes, of course it is. But think for a moment. To vow poverty is to renounce the freedom to own property. To vow chastity is to renounce the right to marry and to have a family of one's own, and to vow obedience is to surrender one's legitimate autonomy. In Catholic teaching, property, marriage, family, and personal freedom are great goods, blessings given by the Creator Himself, as the opening chapters of Genesis tell us. But if there is no higher perfection to put into right perspective these goods that belong to this life and this world, then this worldly goods easily become absolutes by default. Certainly no Christian should question the holiness and goodness of marriage. As St. John Chrysostom said, whoever denigrates marriage also diminishes the glory of virginity. The most excellent good is something even better than what is admitted to be good. Still consider this point. 
Not everyone is able to marry. Not everyone can have children. Not everyone has property. Not everyone has personal freedom. Many who have had these blessings have lost a spouse or a child, endured the sorrow of a failed marriage and divorce, or been impoverished or unjustly oppressed. For Christ's followers, no human blessing can be an end in itself, and no human sorrow need crush us unless it leads us away from the love of God. Monks and nuns and all who live the evangelical councils, by freely renouncing marriage, property, and personal freedom for the sake of the kingdom, are consecrated witnesses to this truth. Their special consecration puts all human blessings and all human sorrows in their true perspective. In a special way, we may apply these words from the letter to the Hebrews to the monks and nuns and other consecrated men and women who have gone before us. These all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. If we Catholics become tongue-tied in defending the higher perfection of religious life, that means that we have capitulated to a secularized age. And if consecrated men and women do not foster the sense of the sacred and the hope of the kingdom, then who will? I have no doubt that the decline in priestly and religious vocations is due in part to the misguided attempt to put all Christian vocations on the same level. The result has been a crisis of identity and mission among priests and religious, and a disinterest in priesthood and religious life among young Catholics. We need to recover our courage and our confidence in encouraging the young to consider priestly and religious vocations. As always, this must begin by prayer for vocations, but it must not stop there. Priests and monks and nuns and other vowed religious must reflect their distinctive identity and consecration. Parents and family must actively encourage vocations among their children and never oppose them. In this willingness to surrender them into the Lord's service, Catholic spouses will find the perfecting of their own vocation of marriage and family life. In his letter to the Philippians, St. Paul sums up admirably what it means to seek perfection in Christian discipleship. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own.